This is Religion Today with Martin Tanner, a weekly look at religion and spirituality here at home and around the world. Now, here's your host, Martin Tanner. Welcome. This is Religion Today. I'm your host, Martin Tanner. Today we look at an issue that comes up from time to time about the Book of Mormon. There are critics of the church who from time to time claim there is no evidence for the information that's in the Book of Mormon. Archaeology just doesn't support it. There is no place called Zarahemla or a place called Nephi. There's no location in the old world called Bountiful, and so on and so forth. And there are even some people in the church, because of a reluctance to go out on a limb, who might say the same thing. There just is no real evidence. It has to ta- be taken entirely on faith. Now, first of all, a, a word of belief and acceptance of a general comment that no genuinely religious phenomenon can be completely proven, just like no political precept or or other uh, precept uh, that that's a real matter of belief can be proven. It, it's something that you have to believe. For instance, if we go to Jerusalem and look at all the sites there, does that prove that Jesus was the Son of God? Of course not. It it shows that historically there was a person named Jesus and that he did certain things during his life, and from there one makes a judgment based on faith or lack of faith as to whether or not that is true. Well, in the very same way, I do not believe that it will ever be possible to prove the spiritual content of the Bible or the Book of Mormon. However, we do want to operate in a context from archaeology and other things that shows that the events in the Bible are plausible and the events in the Book of Mormon are also plausible. Now, first, a word about the Bible. There are those who would roam around and and say that every single thing that's within the pages of the Bible, or at least a vast majority of them, can be shown to be true. Why? Because there is a Jerusalem. There is a Bethlehem. The locations that are described in the Bible have been found. Well, that's not enough. There are still many unproven things in the Bible, archaeologically speaking. Uh, Professor William Deaver, one of the great promoters of Jewish faith and, and a true scholar on early Jewish culture, and archaeologists take the position that it's really difficult to prove a lot of this, but the evidence, the basic evidence is there. Not much you can really find to prove that an exodus happened. Not much you can really find to prove that the walls of Jericho came tumbling down the way they're described in the Bible. What archaeological evidence could there possibly be that a whale or a great fish a swallowed Jonah. Things like that are just not susceptible to archaeology. But having said that, there are basic things that can be demonstrated. The locations, the time frames, the climate that are described within the Bible are generally believed to be true. And then the question arises, can the same thing be said about the Book of Mormon? And my emphatic answer is yes, with a few qualifications. The first qualification is that there is far more archaeology about the Bible and its locations than there is about anything even remotely connected with the Book of Mormon locations in Mesoamerica. Now, at this point, there are a few people who are listening who have been to recent seminars that certain people have conducted that would place Book of Mormon archaeology in the Great Lakes location. Well, believe what you will. And there are a few things that I'll mention today that will give the reasons why I don't find those proposed locations plausible. But 
I will say that there is evidence for Book of Mormon sites and locations. But archaeology dealing with the Book of Mormon is in its infancy. A huge, a vast number, probably more than 90% of the possible and potential archaeological sites that deal with the Bible have been excavated. Almost the reverse, actually more than the reverse is true. When you're dealing with potential Book of Mormon sites, far less than 3% of them by most calculations, have ever been excavated at all. So that leaves us with a complete dearth of information. But there is some, and that is a fascinating thing to look into, and that's really the focus of our program today. So where did the things that are mentioned in the Book of Mormon happen? The Book of Mormon really doesn't say a whole lot about geography or about distances. Those aren't really the purpose the book was written for, so why would we expect them to be there? But we do have some fascinating clues. If you take a look at Alma chapter 22, verse 28, it talks about the place called First Inheritance. That's the place where the Nephites landed, according to the Book of Mormon story. And it is near the western seashore. Right there, that seems to be a problem for people with the Great Lakes location. Because a western location for where the Nephites landed is not near the Great Lakes. It just isn't. The next point is... In Alma chapter 22, verses 30 through 34, a little bit later on in the chapter, in 52, verse 9. In Mormon, chapter 2, verse 29, and in several other places that are easy to look up, there's a discussion about a narrow neck of land between the East and the West Sea, connecting the lands northward and southward between the lands Desolation and Bountiful. Now, it also says in there, in Alma chapter 22, verse 32, that it was a day and a half's journey for a Nephite to traverse this narrow neck of land. Now, what does that mean? A man can cover up to 100 miles a day if it's a person who's in good shape. And there are some men who could go a lot more than that, but someone in good shape, and that's their job, can go 100 miles a day. The Isthmus of Tuanapec there in the Yucatan Peninsula is uh, less than 150 miles across. So a day and a half journey for... A Nephite foot traveler to traverse that land? Yes, that's about the right distance that the Book of Mormon describes. Day and a half journey from a sea east to a sea west Great Lakes location? Not so much. A little bit more difficult to draw that one out. Then we have the description about the place called Desolation in the Book of Mormon. It's described as being north of Bountiful and bordering at the narrow neck of land near the Jaredite land of a place called Moron. That's described in Alma chapter 22, verses 30 through 32, and several other places, including Ether chapter 7, verse 6. And then we find a description of where Bountiful is in connection with that land. It was south of the land of desolation, south, bordering the narrow neck of land, but it was north of Zarahemla. We learn about that in Alma 22, verses 29 through 32, and again in Helaman, chapter 1, verses 26 through 29. Now, when we come back a little bit more about Book of Mormon geography, how it fits together with Mesoamerica, but not so much with the Great Lakes and where some specific places are located. Welcome back. I'm Martin Tanner. This is 
religion today. If you'd like to be in touch with me about this or any other subject, send me an email. I'll be happy to respond. Send it to martinstanner at gmail.com. I'll be happy to respond. Today our subject is Book of Mormon geography and locations based on archaeology. And if you're just joining us, point has been made by a number of people that, well, maybe all the Book of Mormon things happened somewhere near the Great Lakes, close to the Hill Cumorah described by Joseph Smith. Well, the problem with that is um, many-fold, but it just doesn't fit the main location for the place of first inheritance, the place where all these things happen, being near a western seashore. It also doesn't fit the place where there's a narrow neck of land, where there's a day and a half journey from seas to sea west at the narrow neck of land. And now time to talk about some other reasons why the geography described in the Book of Mormon is properly located, I believe, in Mesoamerica. The River Sidon empties into the sea and it flows to the east of the city of Zarahemla. And it begins in the wilderness between the lands of Nephi and Zarahemla. It's a major river and it flows east. What major river is there in North America that flows east in the right location. I cannot think of any. The um, Crealva River does that in the Mesoamerican context, and it does it very, very well, and it's in the right location. The River Sidon is described in Alma chapter 3, verse 3, again in Alma chapter 6, verse 7, And again in chapter 22, verse 27, it talks about the way the river Sidon flows. Then you have the city of Zarahemla, west of the river Sidon, in the center of the land, south of Bountiful. Where in North America can you get something in the center of the land? that's west of the river Sidon that's going east into the sea. I don't know where you do that, but you can do that in Mesoamerica. The location actually works. And then you have Nephi, the land and the city, which is south of the land of Zarahemla, separated by a narrow strip. That's described in Omni chapter 1, verse 12. And again in Mosiah chapter 7, verses 1 through 7. So here, with all this information, we learn that Nephi and Zarahemla were not too far apart. And it only took Ammon's party of missionaries 40 days to travel from Zarahemla to the land of Lehi-Nephi, where the city of Nephi was located, when they didn't even know the way according to Messiah chapter 7, verses 1 through 7. Try that in a North American context. Alma and his converts traveled from the waters of Mormon by the city of Nephi to Zarahemla in 21 days, according to Messiah chapter 18, verses 1 through 7. Now, if the Mormon pioneers could travel about 10 or 11 miles a day, Guatemalan groups travel at about the same rate of speed or possibly a little bit slower. If Alma and his converts traveled at that speed, they would have gone about 230 miles. And as the crow flies, the distance would have been way less because nobody ever walks in a straight line in real geography. Maybe 150, 200 miles, something like that. And if Zarahemla is in the heart of the land, then If you start adding these things together, the total span of the Book of Mormon might be maybe 
three or four hundred miles. That would be about it. You can't do that in a North American context. It doesn't work so well. Some people say, well, what about the fact that um, you have the Hill Cumorra up there in upstate New York? Well, there are lots of hills that are a Mount Olympus. There are lots of hills that have different names. There are lots of state streets. There are lots of Jefferson Avenues. There are many ge geographic features that have the same kinds of names. And so naming a hill something in Mesoamerica and then giving another one the same name in a different location to me is easy. Old York in England, New York in the New World. Jersey in the Old World, New Jersey in the United States happens all the time, happens frequently. Here's another potential problem with the Great Lakes location. The only mention of snow and cold in the Book of Mormon. Snow and cold. The only mention is in Isaiah quotations. There are, however, mentions in Alma chapter 46, verse 40 of fevers, which would be typical of humid tropical, semi-tropical lands. It says they were very frequent among the Nephites. How do you get around the fact that snow is not mentioned if you're trying to push for a Great Lakes location? They'd be mentioning it all the time. The great winter of such and such. I mean, that's the kind of thing that would be described over and over and over again in the Book of Mormon if it was a Great Lakes location. So, if we take the position that the Book of Mormon lands are in Mesoamerica, from Guatemala to Veracruz, which is southern Mexico, then do we have any information about actual locations? And in fact, we do. In Ether chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, and again in chapter 10, in verses 17 and 18, there's a city where Kish was king. It's probably the Mayan city of San Lorenzo in southern Veracruz, Mexico. Kish is the Mayan word for bird. Kish is the name in the Book of Mormon. And the hieroglyphics all over this city of San Lorenzo say a king named Kish was born in about 993 B.C. and ascended to the throne in 967 B.C. Fits very well with the Book of Mormon. Mosiah chapter 7 verses 6 and 7 talks about the land of Nephi up from Zarahemla. It's probably the mountain range called Chuchumatenes by the Mayans. It's a narrow strip of land where the river Sidon originates. Because the Grijalva River originates there, this is a perfect candidate for it. Here's another one. There's discussed in Ether chapter 9 verse 3, a Jaredite hill called Shim, which is very likely the Mayan hill Shim, by the same name, later called by the Aztecs Chintepec. This is probably in the Tuxtla Mountains of southern Veracruz. Chin means corn, Tepec means hill, and corn hill is what this says, corn hill. The Mayan and Aztec legends say that the corn traditionally grown on that hill grows forth from the dead bodies of their ancestors. In the Book of Mormon, the Jaredites were slaughtered on the hill. It fits perfectly. There are a number of others that I could go through here, but suffice it to say that I believe the hill in called Rama Kimura, um has also been found, as well as the waters of Ripliancum and the city of Nephi, which is the western edge of Guatemala City, and the river Sidon, which is the Grijalva River. All of those locations have, I believe, been found. So there is archaeological and geographic evidence in Mesoamerica which fits precisely with the descriptions in the Book of Mormon.